All right. Uh, you recording? You should record too. Let me record. Hold on. I'm recording. Is Wait, my sound give me, It's very echoey. Get... What? Oh, is it echoey? Am I echo? It's echoey in my room, but I think if I'm in the mic, what were you going to say? I got to do what? You got to make me uh, be able to record again. Oh, because you left. This is great. Like my dad. <laughs> uh, oh, shit. This is, and I got my backpack on the bed. This is already so. Who cares? I, I want to have a good, uh, you know, background. I don't have, you have a different background every time. That's part of the fun. <laughs> That's part of the fun. Okay. I think so. Um, Action. Act cut. Um, fucking hate cut. It doesn't make any sense. Well, you know, we're just I feel like I look okay. It. My skin looks good, but look at this. I mean, this is called, uh, I believe it's called complaining down. Like you're complaining to someone who's in a much worse situation. You know, it's like if you're complaining about like, um, you know, oh, my taxes, I have so much money. It's like, you know, this is shit I deal with my whole life. I, I don't mean to be unempathetic, but like, you know, I'm actually fat. Um, no, that's <laughs> that's true. But like, you but know. you look but to me, don't you understand how it works? To me, you look great. What? Why? I don't know. You look happy. You, you got all of skin, oh, all of oil. You. Wow, you really you, turned this around. You, <laughs> you really turned this around. Yeah, I, I, frankly, good. I was a, a little I feel like you're I was going to accuse you of cultural appropriation to feel like, you know, insecure about a double chin. You know, is this funny? Last night, I, I, these people did this as a bit. It did well. People that like don't know how to like fantasize, like I'm like, oh man, I would love to have a house on the beach. And then there's the guy that's like, yeah, but the taxes will kill you. <laughs> and I'm like, well, there's no taxes in this situation. Like, why would I fantasize about taxes? Yeah, that's hilarious. Yeah, I, um, my dad, it's so sad. He's like a square guy, and he's always like, your mom will never let me buy a Miata. You know, I'm one day she'll let me buy a Miata. It's like, even in his fantasy, it's still not that great of a car. Yeah, it's like, like, whatever. Like, wouldn't I'm trying to get your mom to buy me a, a, a Mazda? <laughs> it's like, why? Don't you, if it's not going to happen, just have it be a Ferrari. Yeah, why um, not? Exactly. Yeah, um, no, that's hilarious. Oh, the taxes. It's like... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You're a fun person. Um, well, it's also like the young Republicans, you know, the ones in high school. Like they're oh literally... boy, you sure you want to go down this road? <laughs> I'll just <laughs> go down be... it. Well, they're literally like, I don't want the taxes I don't pay going yeah, I mean, to that's... other people. It's like even in their fantasy, they're assholes. Yeah, that. Yeah. Well, that's the classic thing: is worried about the rich people's taxes when you make. Twenty thousand dollars a year, right? Or you don't even like, pay taxes. Like they don't even. Young Republicans in high school don't pay anything, but they're still. They're not even. They're hypothetically greedy, which is right. The worst kind, and it's you know? the poor people that will benefit from the rich people paying the taxes. Yes, yes, and but, the military. Well, we've lost a hundred percent of our audience, <laughs> so that's fun. Yeah. Anyway, by uh, the way, I'm on the road right now. I'm meeting a bunch of Joe and Ron on heads or whatever really? the fuck they are. Yeah. A bunch of like a bunch of people. One guy last night was telling me all about how we got broke back wrong or something. But so there's oh, a wow. lot of a lot of fans. Do they the ask show. where I am? What's that you said? Do they ask where I am? Like, you know, like like do that are like they're like, where's Ron on? You know, what's he up to? No, not yet. But <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there. It's um, more it's more like we love you're great. We really love Mark. And we started listening to that other bullshit. That's kind of oh, OK. Like, yeah, that's the beginning. Yeah. It's baby yeah. Steps. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, well, uh, yeah, no, it looks like you're, you're taking a lot of pictures and it looks like it's going well at uh, what is it, Kansas, the comedy club. What's I'm it called? in Kansas. It's the comedy club of Kansas City. But the hotel is in Leewood, Kansas. And I'm going to a movie today. To see Edgar Wright made a documentary about these guys, the Sparks Brothers. Do you know the Sparks Brothers? No. Nobody knows. I got to send you this trailer. You'll be so intrigued. In the trailer, it's like all these great artists being like, they are the most influential musicians ever. Sparks Brothers. I've never heard of them. They're, and then there's like footage of them playing in front of 100,000 people. It's like, it's insane. Who are they? What I mean, what type, type of music? They kind of have, they started in like 1967 and like uh. they have like an 80s sound, like a synthesizer ahead of their time. I got to send you this trailer. I, I can't wait to see this movie. I'm like, I'm dumbfounded. You know, we're pretty deep music guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's that's exciting. I saw I saw my second movie in the theater uh, two days ago, uh, The Conjuring 3. I heard it's a pile of poo. The devil made me do it. Yeah, it's the worst shit ever. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it sounds yeah. like it stinks. But, um, um, how about this? My MC, by the way, picked me up. He's listening to John Prine. I'm like, I'm like this guy. Oh, he's really? Like, yeah, he's like 20 years old. I want to blow this Oh, guy. that's so exciting. I love when people love John Prine. God, he's I know, he's a 21-year-old kid. Yeah, that's great. Most famous person to die in the pandemic, wouldn't you say? 
I stole that from you and said it to him. So now I'm going to look like a hack when he sees this. <laughs> well, it's not a joke. It's just a, it's an obvious, it's a fact, right? Is there anyone more famous? No, I don't think so. I don't even think there's anybody of significance. They all deserved it other than him. I feel like Trump basically killed John Prime. I mean, we're really bleeding out <laughs> the audience here. I mean, are you serious? <laughs> we're trying to build, for God's sakes. I don't think, I don't think the podcast that has sideways and elections, are like, I don't know if we have this alt-right fan base that you think we do. Yeah, but you think it's all right. This is where you're going to lose them again. <laughs> They're just regular conservatives that are like, oh, great. Here we go. First of all, nobody wants to hear about Trump. We did all the. All Trump right. Stuff. All right. All right. All right. Let's, well, let's talk about these movies because I we fucking first of all, everyone shits on me like, oh, w w does Ron like anything? This is going to be the greatest jerk off fest ever. The it's episode, ironically, after Louie, this is going to be the greatest jerk off fest ever. <laughs> like, it's, it's going mean, to be incredible. This is going to be there's some people that are like the show is best when they disagree and they fight when other people are like the, be the show is best when they just trash a movie. This is not the episode for you. I am going to stick Alexander Payne's <laughs> cock all the way down my throat and swallow. I'm jizzing all over his face. He is the I'm the cocking all over. He is. First of all, he is my favorite. He is my and I'm I am a uh, I was going to say struggling screenwriter. I'm a f failed screenwriter. Well, yes. no, I've written a lot of screenplays. I'm still doing it. There's some interest. And uh, and he is my biggest influence. And these two movies, Election and Sideways, are in my top five. In my my top five. Wow. They're both in there. Yeah, it's it's amazing. Well, these are the movies that are so good that it makes you rethink your top ten because my top ten has a lot of stuff from childhood. Yeah. You know what I mean? Feel the dreams, Apollo get that 13. Feel the dreams Gump. out. Get those because movies out there. And put, put, put all of the paid movies. It makes you rethink. It makes you want to no longer state because of movies like Lost in Translation, Brokeback Mountain, yeah. and these two movies. I'm like, well, these are like the real thick this is, come, yeah, you know? this is this is this is what movies should be about. This That's is like right. to me, this is like what let's start with election because it's like, you know, let's do it chrono chronologically. Watching election, I'm like this is what I want from a movie. I want to see real life, which is essentially what reality is. Different people with different viewpoints competing with each other and trying to get validation and trying to feel like they matter in life. That's life. Not this fucking Avengers bullshit. Like election to me is, I don't know. It's just like, I feel like I'm just looking at human nature. You know, it's just incredible. Yeah, it's incredible. And this is like I talked about this with Jaws and No Country. I actually get anxiety for podcasts like this because I'm like, I'm not going to be able to get in all the points I want to get or articulate what a fucking masterful film this is. And it's it, the interesting thing about Alexander Payne is he's made some movies that I think like stink out loud. No, I, I actually he's my favorite director. And I've also walked out of a movie of his. I Which walked one? out of the well, Descendants. No, no. Descendants I saw was pretty good, but not oh, great. Descendants stinks. I didn't think it was awful, but yeah, you don't get eh, fuck. You don't have George Clooney in a pain movie. You need the uh, George you know, Clooney stinks. But uh, no, no, no. It's downsizing. He tried to do like oh, a I heard Charlie this. Kaufman type movie, and it was just awful. I walked out, which is, but like to me, his first four movies are just fucking masterpieces. I mean, just one after the other. Well, Citizen Ruth, I just started watching. I haven't finished it. It looks so, but one one critique of Citizen Ruth, whoever the DP was, it's too dark. It's like you Is can't it even dark? see. Like really like dark lighting, dark. I don't remember that. No, you you'll love it. It's it's so great. I mean, he um, it, it really is. It's just, it's an awesome movie. If you haven't seen it, one of the most underrated comedies, but it, I think it got badly marketed. I think maybe. Laura Dern didn't want to fuck Harvey Weinstein or something, so he like did bad like publicity for it or something. That none of that's true, but it is Harvey Weinstein did produce it. It was like it was like badly marketed, but it's a great movie. But like Election, like rewatching Election, I, I I don't mean to go back to what we talked about last week, but this is just a thought I had: is that in Election, you see every character's desires, their lusts, their dreams so closely, you know. And you feel it. And like with There Will Be Blood, like I remember last week we were talking, well, it's interesting. Daniel Day-Lewis is never into women in it and he doesn't seem to enjoy anything. Yeah, because it's a great performance playing a symbol. <laughs> That's really what it is. It's a symbol with a great performance. Paul Dano, you don't really see what Paul Dano wants out of things. You don't really see what Daniel Day-Lewis wants. It's all abstract. But with this, you see these flesh and blood people 
who have sexual feelings and they want to feel validation. They want to feel like they matter in life and they're constantly doing the compare and despair. And that's life. You're watching reality. Yeah, no, it's, it's exactly. It's, a, and it's amazing on so many levels. I mean, it's obviously, maybe it's not obvious. I mean, it's a satire of the American political system and so many yes. other things. I mean, right. it's just, a, and, and I think when you first watch it, you're not, you're not even realizing that. You're like, oh, this is like a high school movie. It's about high school drama. Yes, and it um, is, yes. Mm -hmm. And it, it's so great. I mean, and obviously like culminating with, with him in front of the White House and literally running towards the White House. Yes. And there's just so many great things. And there's so much, I was just, we just, I just made funny if we're talking about Trump, but there's so much like Trumpism before Trump. Yes, I mean, like nihilism, his sister yeah. is such a Trump like character. And there's been other characters like that before, obviously, in American politics. But like when she goes up, the, it reminded me. And this is what was amazing about Trump is we're all sort of the, the whole system relies on everyone buying into the system of like, yes. we've got to get one yes. of these people who went to Harvard and then worked his way up and was a senator and a congressman. We got to do this because that's the way the system has to work. And then you just get this girl going. Who gives a shit? I don't even <laughs> want to be president. I don't give a fuck. And everyone's like, yeah. Which, by the way, that scene almost brings me to tears. It's like, I, I'm weirdly so moved by that scene. Just seeing everyone clap and her connecting with everyone and her revealing the bullshit behind it. Because, like, I do think, and I, the movie is, like, obviously, like, I think it was maybe allegorically based on the election with Bill Clinton, Ross Perot. And, um, right. But, but to me, it's way beyond like, that is part of it, but it's way beyond that into just human nature in general, but it is as an election thing, such a perfect idea. The best way to have a uh, satire about how politics doesn't mean anything is literally have it set in high school where it literally doesn't mean anything. So it's like exactly. the perfect, it's like the perfect way to express that, you know? Yeah, it's exactly it's exactly right. This person is not going to have any actual power whatsoever, which you yes. can make the case the president doesn't really in R our system. Right. And it's all about them. It's all about their own. You know, no, there is like a big part of this movie that altruism is uh, is kind of an illusion <laughs> and right. when you under it. Even Matthew Broderick, who he, he thinks of as this great teacher who is a good teacher, but like under that altruism and under that him trying to teach democracy to the dumb kid to try to get him to, under that it's just pure animalistic <laughs> selfishness and that's society and it, it, it the movie fucking makes you see that like the, the narcissism under everything you know and there's something so sweet that the everyone is very narcissistic and and kind of full of shit and out for themselves and willing to do anything for themselves except this one jock Yes, Bonehead, <laughs> who is like the dumbest one. And he's like the sweetest guy. He's actually would be the best candidate because he's actually thoughtful. One of the most beautiful parts is at the end where they're all praying <laughs> and which is such an amazing moment because you get to once again, see what they want. You're literally looking into their souls. You're seeing we are kind of defined by our desires and our dreams and you're seeing into their souls. And his is the only one who's like, whatever happens, I'm just really grateful and then he just talks about his sister. <laughs> right, <laughs> he's right. just like, I hope my sister, like, he's so sweet. And he's so like, yeah, it's hilarious, which technically this is where the, the specific political allegory falls off, because a lot of people say it's the 92 election, but he's obviously nothing like Bill Clinton. You know what I mean? Like, Bill well, Clinton. He's blown. Uh, oh. <laughs> yeah, but it's not. But no, she's Bill coming Clinton's off to him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and a rapist. Yeah, and a as rapist. As far as I can tell. Yes, he's, <laughs> he's a rapist. Uh, he's a very charming rapist but like uh but this guy is so sweet which is which is there's just such added like it's a sat i don't know it's to me it's yeah i'm gonna sound like an idiot on this one too i'm gonna be a bumbling fool because it's like it's a satire and it as as like the tone is very lighthearted and fun and yet it's such a dark view of human nature you know what i mean right. it's about people who don't change people who are kind of caught in these delusions, not really aware of what's driving them. Like Matthew Broderick never really comes to terms with himself, you know? Right. And yet as dark a view of human nature, it is, you see all their loneliness and you feel for them. And that's what I want in a movie. I want to see piece of shits that I feel for. That's all I ask for piece of shits that I empathize with. Yeah. And, and on top of that, the jokes are amazing. I mean, it's very much Incredible. like the Simpsons. It's like the Simpsons where it works on so yes. many different levels where like people, I don't want to say dumb people, but dumb people 
can be like, oh, that's funny. He's getting blown. There's yes. some really great dick jokes in there. And then it, obviously it's like satire and it's lay. I mean, and it's satirizing religion, American politics, high school. I mean, it's really satirizing hypocrisy. a lot of things. It's and democracy. Yeah. I mean, so many great jokes when he's explaining apples and oranges. Oh and then, I mean, the one of my favorite jokes in the whole movie, and he goes, oh, I also like bananas. One of the, I wrote it down. One of the he goes, greatest. exactly. <laughs> I'm sorry, exactly. Yeah. One of the, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. That's one of the best parts. Like him just, which is actually kind of perfect that you brought this up now because we're talking about how the movie works on an entertaining level. You don't even have to understand all the metaphors, you know? Mm -hmm. And literally, you know, the part, part where he does not understand the metaphor. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, he's literally just looking at it literally. He's just like, I like apples and pears. And then the whole thing about democracy, and then he's just like, oh, and banana. Like, that <laughs> moment where he says, and bananas, and you realize he hasn't gotten it at all right. it's just completely literal based <laughs> right and also i mean he throws in a third one which is i mean it's on an even deeper level at the very end he throws in a third fruit yes. which is his sister i mean that's his yes. sister right right who jumps in at the end but at, no, but that pause of broderick and he feels hiding he, tell you, yeah. he feels bad and so he just goes exactly you him got no, it yeah exactly yeah him yeah no it's fucking hilarious and it, it is like what we're talking about, like a movie, uh, like p idiots can love this movie or p not idiots, but people who don't really look at things metaphorically can just be like, this is an entertaining, hilarious story, you know? And that's what a movie should be. Like a movie should have a concrete story. And then the, the metaphor, the allegory should be extrapolated from a story that works on its own. I don't mean to keep on going back to this, but with There Will Be Blood, to me, it's not a concrete story. If you're an idiot, you won't get it because it's ultimately you need to know the metaphors going on. And to me, election is what I look for. This is my personal taste. I, I like a story to be concrete at its core. It's a concrete story. And then you can, can extrapolate the symbolism yourself. You know, I, I don't agree with one part of there will be blood. I don't think you have to be smart to get there will be blood. It is entertaining to people that don't need more. Like I, I showed it to my buddy and he just thought it was a movie about a guy with oil it's entertaining it's funny it's ah, exciting it's right. beautiful like he was my friend wasn't like uh oh this is about capitalism he was just right, like oh right. that was great that was great that guy wanted oil and then it, it ruined his life so i Man, do think it works your without... friend would be so insulted to know that you're just using him as a reference for like an idiot well that's why i said friend and not <laughs> specifically who he is <laughs> you'll tell me after um sure yeah you don't know you... him but you're right. Yeah. No, I, let me stop talking about the only one. But I, th whatever. This is my cup of tea. These movies about human nature are my fucking cup of tea. And, and watching it again, like, it's also just so, like, well directed right away. Like, right he, away. He's so, Pain is so good visually. It's like one of the best screenplays ever. But, and I, I, I read a little commentary I remember saying in the beginning you, there's so much planned thoughtfulness. Like, you see him walking in circles, running in a, a circle. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you see this guy who's caught in circles, running in circles, not really moving forward with his life. And then you see Reese Witherspoon with the table, and the, you know, with the legs and you just see these straight lines like this forward momentum. So you visually see them both like represent different things, you know, right away. Well, yeah. And he's literally they have that overhead shot. God. And he's like walking through the fence, through the which maze. is all zigzag. It's like a maze. And then also the opening shot of just this methodic yes. sprinkler, which is flooding the field it's not yeah. <laughs> doing the job and it's just this to 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 it's annoying it's this annoying repetitive redundant sound that's ruining the field that's supposed to be helping yeah like politics just this kind of empty thing we do over and over again and you know don't really get anything you know it's just the same thing over and over again you know do you think it's um, an homage to Ferris Bueller that he's showering at the very beginning? It feels very like this is Ferris Bueller grown up to me, but maybe I'm looking too much into it. No, I mean, I do think casting plays a huge part in this movie. And I do think I don't know, like, I, I don't know about the shower, but yes, I do think like play, having this kid who this actor is famous for being like, you know, the popular, awesome kid in high school and then now being like a doughy loser, that definitely that casting memory plays a part in how you perceive him, you know? I, Yes. And, and that being said, and the knowledge of that and then putting him early on in the shower, almost the exact shot as yes. Ferris Bueller does feel like to me, like, here's Ferris now. This is no, what for sure. Ferris turns into. For sure. That, that, that is intentional, like, casting because he is now. I mean, what better way to show, like, what life does to you than show the kid who, like, was awesome in high school now being one of the boring teachers that he would have fucking hated, you know?
Yeah, still and still cool. And by the way, I mean, I've got so many notes down. The yeah. first five minutes are just perfect. A lot of it reminds me of Rushmore a lot, which came out the oh, yeah. year before. There's very similarities to sure, Rushmore. Definitely. Like Tracy Flick is very similar to uh, Max. Well, Fisher. you know, you know, the big part, the montage of all the things she does at school. Yeah, That's like exactly. such a Max Fisher moment. You know what I mean? Yes, completely. And how perfect is the janitor? I mean, that face. I mean, yeah. amazing casting. Pitch perfect. Everybody is so goddamn perfect in this movie. I mean, one of the greatest performances of all time. When I mean, we talked about One Flew Over Cuckoo's Nest, like the head of the guy, head of the the uh, asylum being so, such great casting. I mean, that principal, one of the greatest, just the gr- greatest depiction of a principal of all time. Just has no interest in anything <laughs> besides the rules. The, the, what, the part where he's just like, She's a troublemaker and she's on my list. Like the fact that like, he, at this point, all he cares about is finding the troublemakers and making sure they don't cause trouble. You know, he's great. And he has a cameo in Sideways. Yeah, I know. Yeah. He's also in VP. He's just fucking amazing. Yeah. Um, no, he's he's great. Uh, he sounds just like one of the Wilson brothers. I thought he was like he sounds like, like Owen Wilson, <laughs> like like he sounds like Owen Wilson and, and the other Wilson that's in. Yeah, I can Rushmore. see that. Like they sound very similar, but um, just so hilariously like bureaucratic and dead inside. It's just so perfect for when he calls her a bitch. That bitch. What he calls Tammy oh, yeah, a yeah. bitch. <laughs> that's great. Also, amazing casting is the the teacher. Uh, I forget his name. That was fucking Tracy Flick. Oh yes, which I mean, by the, he, yeah, he's great because he's like he's not hot. He's kind of like he's just like a whatever cheese dick, but you can see a young girl thinking he's hot. I mean, and yes. that cut because the movie feels like one thing, and it's the moment that it cuts to him, and he's like, her pussy gets so wet. <laughs> That's the moment where you're like, whoa, this is a different kind of movie than I realized. I thought this was gonna be like a high school drama. Yeah, which by the way, I mean, and, and once again, I just realized I'm showing a lot of chest hair today. Is it yeah, hot? it's a little obscene. You look like you're wearing my <laughs> sister's shirt. <laughs> you look like a housewife. <laughs> just, I'm trying to turn. I'm trying to turn you on, but <laughs> I'm trying to seduce you like Reese Witherspoon. Uh, but uh, wait, is it too obscene? Should I put it on another shirt? No. <laughs> no, we should keep going. It's funny. <laughs> but so. <laughs> So, yeah, so um, and this is once again, not I just love pointing out the things that could not fly today or like would not work. I don't I'm not like offended, you know, don't get all fucking call me snowflake. But it is hilarious that like one thing that would not fly today is you they would not allow Matthew Broderick, the main character, to be like hear about a teacher having sex with an underage student and just be like. Don't tell me about this. Like the fact that he doesn't get the police involved or anything. Right, right. And not only that, but he's also mad at her. Right. right. That's something. And I I think it's great. And it's great in the movie. But that's something like these days you'd be like, this would be the most unlikable character of all time. You can't have that in a movie. You know, no, it's amazing that movies, great movies. The other movie I'm thinking of is almost famous. Great movies that came out late 90s, early 2000s that just would not fly now. You wouldn't even be able to fucking, uh, you know, what do you call them? Uh, distribute them. There's a lot of masterpieces involving statutory rape that's not shown in like a judgmental way. Well, that's three of them we just <laughs> named. I mean, Cooper's know, Nest, Almost Famous, up. and, and uh, whatever we're talking about, Election. I mean, that's yeah, three like masterful, great films. That <laughs> involves statutory rape, excessive statutory rape. Statutory rape where Matthew Broderick is just like, whoa, whoa, whoa don't like tip. And, and, and at that point, at that point of the movie, like that was like the moral high ground. Him just being like, don't tell me about this. But that's a perfect subtle thing about yes. Matthew Broderick's character is that it seems like he's doing the right thing. In his mind, he's doing the right thing. Don't tell me about this. And he says, this is wrong. But he doesn't yes. actually take the right action. I mean, that's no. why it's so perfect. It's such a perfect metaphor, really. Yes. And ultimately, like to me, I think at the core of this movie is Matthew Broderick's and it's not fully explored, but it's suggested obviously a lot. Matthew Broderick's sexual attraction to Reese Witherspoon, which he can never really fully come to terms with. But the fact is, he is really attracted to her and his attraction to her makes his life feel like a fraud. And it makes him angry that he's attracted to her. And I think that plays a big part in the movie outside of the, you know, obviously the shit that he knows she's going to be successful and all that. I do think attract, you know, I do think his attraction to her plays a huge part in this. And his complete disdain, which is really 
hilarious. I mean, it's the, the, the whole plot of the movie, the, the engine that keeps the movie running is hilarious of this high school, you know, adult a guy in his 40s who just fucking loathes a high school girl. I mean, it's really yes. hilarious. I mean, that, and that's the it's whole amazing. movie is based on him just fucking hating this woman. It's the two greatest, like, to me, one of the classic movies of two of the greatest enemies of all time. Like, the, you know what I mean? The, this is one of the greatest rivalries of all time. And it, it, it's two amazing... Reese Witherspoon gives one of the best performances ever. The fact that she was, wasn't nominated or won is insane to me. Like, it's one of the greatest, like, performances. And Broderick, too. I think Broderick yeah, is amazing. He's amazing. He's yeah. pitch perfect. He's so funny. Let's talk about the apple. I mean, that, that is that just a biblical reference? What's going on with the apples and there's all so, this stuff? Yeah, so there's so many. We could talk a lot. Like, there's so much symbolism and motifs in the movie. I mean, you got a couple. I mean, uh, first of all, by the way, before we get right into it, I just want to say, like, I noticed two watching it, like, in the first scene together with them two, when mm -hmm. she's talking about destiny, she has an amazing speech. She's like... Uh, he in, he uh, he messed with destiny. That's the thing about destiny. It's going to happen anyway, which is just hilarious speech. And also just she's like insane. Like, it's just like, yes. but then as she's saying that you see him take a piece of trash and throw it in the trash can. So you see the over uh, foreshadowing of the ending right there, right. which I didn't notice before. But um, yeah, so you got you got a couple symbols. You got the apples and you also have the Pepsi Cola Coca Cola thing, which they kind of use throughout the movie, you know, right. Um, so, yeah, the apple, I mean, I don't know. For me, it's like, I don't know if it's biblical or it's just kind of like just a constant reminder. Oh, you think it's it, biblical? It's got, well, well, Eve tempted Adam with an apple, right? Right, right, yes. I mean, and then that's how he gets this guy into the election. He's like, what's your favorite fruit? It's true, yeah. Like, and so he, yeah, he tempts yeah. him in with an apple, essentially, and then You're later right. the bees from the apple tree sting him in the face. I mean, it just goes horribly wrong. Oh, fuck. I didn't realize there was an apple tree at the end. Yeah, they show the apples first. You see the apples and the bees flying around it, and then he gets oh, stung yeah, right in the that, eye. Yeah, so, that's totally, yeah. So, yeah, so, yeah, it's like a take on the uh, the original sin. He, because this is destiny. This is like and him him messing with it. Yeah. And like, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, that's great. I didn't realize the bee was from an apple tree. Yeah, I mean, because that's the shit. Because it's funny, because I was like, here come the bees. And then you're like, oh, and shit. And there's those goddamn apples again, which he's eating throughout the movie. Man, I thought I was going to blow your mind with the throwing the trash in the trash can. But this is uh, you really want the trash in the trash can is pretty great. <laughs> no, that's no, that's great. Yeah, you got uh, you got. Yeah. So the apple. Yeah, there's definitely that that take on the biblical thing. Um, and then you also have uh, well, the Coke and the Pepsi, which is throughout the whole thing. Yeah, what she, are some of the Coke and Pepsi things? Well, there's a bunch. So she says the first thing, obviously, that sets it all off, which is he's like, what do you have to worry about? You're running that scene in the car where she, buys, by the way, flirts with him, which also makes him, which right. is such a power shift. She's like, we're going to be working together. <laughs> Another amazing detail, too, is just his seatbelts, that car with the automatic yeah. seatbelts that just come across. And it's almost uh, like he's fucking he's killing himself with those. Pay, yeah, beautiful. Payne is the master of the depressing car. Like he, right, between right. this and sideways, he gets the most. First of all, this car's election is hilarious because it's like there's barely any room in it. It's it's basically just. It's the kind of car where there's seats in the back, but you can't really sit in it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like it's just like it truly is like just like a coffin. It's it's the best car to show someone being so small and minuscule. You know. Right. Um, but the part where she goes up to him and she's like flirting with him, which is so she's such an amazing character. She uses, you know, like she's flirting with him just to basically basically get him to not be cause her trouble. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, <laughs> and she's going to use this is her system that she uses. Yeah. It's worked for her before. So it sees she sees it's not going to work with him. So she's got to take different. Yeah. She's got to drink it. But then she says the thing about Coca-Cola. You know, she's like, what, what, what are you worried? You're running on a post. And she's like. Well, Coca Cola runs, uh, you know, they're they're the most, but they spend the most on advertising, which is just a hilarious line too for Susan to say. And then he's drinking Pepsi, in I believe that next scene, you saw him actually throw a Pepsi in the trash can when he throws, right. this, you know. And then when he's watching the porn, which is another part where it's like I feel like he's not attracted to his wife, his attraction to Reese Witherspoon in this moment is upsetting him. And to, to avoid it, he goes downstairs to jack off to something else because he doesn't want to confront his attraction to Reese Witherspoon. And he goes downstairs. She opens that box, which, by the way, one of the porners in there says big election. election. Yes. A lot of Easter eggs in this movie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but then he um, 
but then he's watching that porno with the cheerleader and he's holding a Pepsi in his hand. And he looks like right. a Pepsi and that gives him the idea for um, the dumb guy. But then at the end, also to tie it all back in, when he sees her in the limo, he throws a Pepsi. He's drinking a Pepsi and he throws that. Right, right. <laughs> right. And then runs to the White House. I mean, there's just so much great. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. I've stayed in that hotel a bunch. The Hay Adams. Uh, with oh, Murray, yeah. Oh, yeah. Fun. Oh, um, hey. um but yeah. the, the other thing that's great, and it happens in election and sideways, which is the greatest depiction of depression. There is no better depiction of depression. And it's in both movies is a person watching porn completely flaccid. Yes. Just not, no sexual, just matter of factly watching porn. Not checking after porn is is <laughs> is uh, the saddest thing you can do it's like that's sadder than anything in Schindler's list just him sitting there just fucking because <laughs> it's like he's not aware of his sexual feelings you know and he doesn't want to accept them and oh that's the other amazing thing about this movie everyone is an unreliable narrator they're all literally lying to the audience like the whole time Matthew Brock is just like I love my job <laughs> which he right. doesn't he deep down hates his job he's like i love my job i love my wife and then you see them barely talk it's hilarious to watch narrators just except for the dumb kid who is completely honest it's hilarious to watch narrators just kind of like he as a narrator is just lying to himself and the audience the entire time um the uh sideways is very similar by the way everyone is lying it's just all lies yes. the whole movie it just um, yeah mm -hmm. Uh, another another great subtle joke from um, what's the kid's name? Chris Klein. Chris Klein. Yeah. Who's just he, so amazing in this. Amazing. And he walks in on his sister and uh, her girlfriend or whatever. And she's like, don't you knock? And he goes, yeah. <laughs> so like so He's just like, funny. oh, what an interesting idea. <laughs> yeah. Because he, he did not. He knocks as he opens. Don't you knock? Yeah. He also um, like. He has some amazing timing. Like every time he brings up something sexual, his tone is so matter of fact that it's like always like a giant laugh line. Just like, and then we had a fuck in the hot tub, and then we had a fuck in a hot tub. You know, he's like, it, she's so grateful. It was so nice for her to come over and blow me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the also, matter of fact sexual shit, like the fact that he has it so much, so he's not excited. It's just like a fact. It's so funny. He also, it's also a flip from usual too, which I love. Is that. You know, Reese Witherspoon is sort of the underprivileged single mom. Yes. You know, they're a little poor and she's a piece of shit. And this guy is completely rich and got, gets everything. But he's the nicest guy. I love that flip that it's not depicted anywhere else. And that certainly wouldn't fly now. Well, that's yeah. another thing that you would never depict now in a movie, which gets to me into a big problem with the way people view life. Now, they're constantly wanting right. everything to fall into a narrative. And reality is constantly breaking that narrative. Sometimes the rich hot guy is nice. And sometimes the poor girl who's never had anything is a piece of shit. And it sucks because you're like, I have my narrative and I want my narrative to be perfect. Just like the narrative of like a, a comedian who's amazing, but he's like, you know, let's say he does something fucked up and, and then people convince themselves, well, I never liked his comedy to begin with. You know what I mean? It's like, you're just trying to force things into a narrative. Sometimes the most talented comedian of all time fucked his daughter and 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 molested his other daughter you know what i mean like that's just the way it is and it doesn't you know and so like i love i think the point of life i think that what i like in life is when reality breaks the narrative the preconceived notions we have and this movie does that the entire time you know yeah it kind of flips everything first of all i did not fuck my daughter i don't know what you're talking about <laughs> uh, um, but uh yeah so yeah i mean it's just and also to me it's like so much of life is us fighting over trivial shit and like it meaning so much about our own validation. So having this all be about an election, which means nothing to me is like, yes, it's an allegory for politics, but it goes beyond that to me. It really does. To me, it goes beyond it to the point where like we all fight over something that means nothing just to show that we matter in the world. And to me, that's everything. Alexander Payne's movies are all about our uh, minuscule nature in the universe and how we don't matter and how the ways we try to find validation. And to me, that's what life is about. And I don't see that in most movies. And yet I think that is, to me, it's like every time I see an Alexander Payne movie, I'm like, this is what every movie should be about. Like, this is like, this is what life is about. You're, you don't matter and you're trying to find ways that you matter. And to me, that's, life and i only like he he does it and not a lot of movies aren't about that yeah no it's pretty 
Amazing. And it is. And then like, I remember Roger Ebert said that about no country. It's like, this is what, this is why I love movies, movies like this and sideways are as just as good as it gets different yes. movie. Not great. Not, not as good. Also very problematic now. Um, but <laughs> a, a couple other things, uh, notes I have that are fun. Yeah. I can just talk about this movie for two hours, but a bunch of notes actually one, this movie contains the greatest voicemail in movie history. Um, only, only the one in swingers can compare, but, when he leaves the voice, he oh, goes, you yeah. ruined my life. I I'm sorry. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> <It's> amazing. <laughs> fucking amazing to go from you ruined my life. And then he just says, I love you to this woman. He fucking his neighbor or whatever. And also just the fact that he's become his fucking, you know, not as immoral, but he's become the mess that his friend was. He's right. become the mess. who's like, I love her. And it's like it's it's it show, it's kind of like the guy who like judges his friend for having an affair. And he's like, it's really fucked up. But then he gets tempted and does the same thing. It's like we all have this moral authority and it's all kind of like just a fucking just a pose, you know, um, to hide our deeper, or darker feelings, you know. And Yes. Another great um, subtle thing is the uh, vice president is just literally useless. He's in a wheelchair. <laughs> he barely talks. He runs on a pose. I mean, that's another great satirical thing in there is the oh vice president is just completely not. He's literally in a wheelchair and everyone's like, oh, OK, sure. You too. And, and such a beautiful detail. It's like when he does the wheelchair joke and right. everyone laughs, the uh, I may not stand, but I'll right. stand for you. And everyone just <laughs> he is paying gets the fucking details just fucking perfect. And like, and everyone like everyone speak what everyone's way of talking is different, and they all speak in a different way, and which is also very true in sideways. Like they both speak in very you know. Fucking Thomas Hayden Church sounds like he's literally in high school the entire time. And Paul Giamatti is using like big words and sounding like very highfalutin. But in this movie, the, the word choices, when Reese Witherspoon says there's some subversive elements at the school, when the idea of a high school student talking like Richard Nixon. Right, <laughs> it's right. just so fucking hilarious. There's a lot of subversive elements. <laughs> Funny. And she is Nixon. Yeah, I mean, she is. And I also think... Uh, and this is something I do think about with Democrats and Republicans, like Republicans kind of, and this is really going to lose people if I have it. Republicans kind of are more immoral. So they succeed a lot more. And in a sense, and that is the game and Democrats are like kind of immoral, but don't fully commit to it. So they fuck up. And I think you could really see that in this movie when Reese Witherspoon, when she tears down all those posters, she brings that shit right to the uh, power plant. Right. Like she's ready to clean it up immediately and she doesn't feel any guilt guilt. Now, obviously that girl sees it, but she's ready to commit to the sin and fucking clean it up without guilt. Matthew Broderick takes those two ballots and just throws them in his trash can, right. which to me represents guilt on some level. He's not fully committed to just cleaning up the, the mess and he gets caught because he can't. He can't fully commit to the immoral action that is what allows you to succeed in politics and in life, you know, interesting, which is like the Democrats being kind of not fully committed to it a little too guilty. So they kind of lose, you know? Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to stay away from this point. But um... <laughs> <laughs> no, I Either, think... you know, because some people be like, wow, he does just throw them in the trash can. That is a little like he just throws them in and just leaves. Yeah, it's insane like, not to put them in your pocket or incinerate there, whatever. But I think to me, I to me, this is the kind of movie where I'm like, there are no mistakes. Like, this is not an inconsistency. The reason he throws them in the trash can and doesn't pick it up is because he is guilty. And part of him, maybe maybe there's a part subconsciously that wants to get caught, you know, because he can't fully commit to the, the, the sinful action. You know? Right. It's um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, <laughs> what else? I, I want to talk a little more. I mean, like. Oh, I mean, a, a couple other things. I mean, we're, this, we've been talking about this one for a while, and I want to talk about Sideways. But um, yeah. also, I love little details. Like, she has a uh, – Tracy Flick has Be Happy over her bed, like a little thing, which is oh, right. so funny because it's like it's not her goal. She's not happy. She's not trying to be happy. It's not even <laughs> – it's just such a great empty thing of, like, let me just put this up. i got to remember to be happy. And she couldn't be less happy. Yeah, be happy for her. She's the kind of person where be happy is something on a to-do list, not like a state of like, do this, do this, do this. And also be happy. Like, it's just something you right, yell at yourself. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's, it's not a like It's a schedule. It's, it's something on your schedule, you know? Be happy. Also, I mean, and this is the other thing, like, 
talking about like discovering shit about the characters when when Matthew Broderick is like Tracy Flick is she'll handle it fine. They do the Ace Ventura, I'm sure she'll be fine. And you see her like bawling. Mm -hmm. To me, that part is so beautiful because it's like as awful as Reese Witherspoon is, you feel her loneliness. And when she's crying in her bedroom after she loses, you fucking feel the pain. You know what I mean? You fucking feel it. Yes, the Alexander pain. And also it becomes she becomes very empathetic. Obviously, her father's yes. not around and her mother is pushing her. Her mother has this thing of where we're poor, where I'm a single mother. We need you to succeed. So she's putting this on her kid and she <laughs> thinks she's doing the right thing. Her mother. And, and this is what she had. She's I mean, this is I mean, we can all relate to this a little bit is like you don't feel enough and you feel like you need this. I need to get yes. this in order to be appreciated and loved. And she didn't get it. And she thought it was rightfully her. She thought this is how I will be happy. And this is how my mother will care about me. And she fell short. It's like we think like if I succeed in comedy or I do well, I'll, I'll be happy. And of course, you exactly. won't. But you think you are and you fall for that. And for her, she's given up on everything else. This is all she has. So when she's crying there, you're watching someone having to like face up to the rejection of the world. And it's just so you feel it. And then the mother, of course, I love that. The mother says some real shitty things like the backhanded thing. Right? She's like, maybe if you put up more posters like I suggested. And they're like, oh, man, this girl who's awful. She is like fucked up by her. Her mother has shaped her into this like your her mother's taken all that you you don't see the whole world but you can tell like the like father isn't there and the mother has shaped this girl to be the kind of empowering woman that the mother could never be and yet by doing that she's kind of created this monster you know and you right. feel so bad and then you feel so bad for her when she was the yearbooks and no one's signing her yearbook you, like you feel so you you feel everyone's loneliness and uh the same with the girl the, the lesbian girl who's amazing who actually the ac actress recently died she died? Yeah, she's in Freaks and Geeks too. Yeah, I think she OD'd recently. Yeah. Oh, God, that's terrible. But that's another thing where you're like, you have Reese Witherspoon who just wants to succeed and she goes so extreme in trying to succeed. And then you have Tammy, who's the opposite. She just wants love, but she goes too extreme in that and goes like overly like idealizing the person she's with into a hyper dramatic way that kind of pushes that person away, you know? Yeah, well, she wants love and sex. We should love add. and yeah, love and sex. But once again, you feel her loneliness so much, and you you you're on her side, and you, I don't know. To me, like when you push away like every all the bullshit in life, we're all just so fragile, and we're all just so like have these little fragile desires. And like watching this movie, you see these characters with those fragile desires, and you're just like, as as. To me, it's like a lot of times in Hollywood, they always have the note. He's he, he's not likable enough, which is always like a shitty note because it's about morality. And it's like to me, this movie, yes, all these characters do not live up to a moral code, which is a lie. But we see their soul and that that's what makes them human, not if they're if they're good or not. But the fact that they have desires, you know, right, right. And they're fucking. And as a result of all that, it's hilarious. Mm. And it's um, so funny and it's entertaining. And I think I, I thought this was sideways and election. It reminds me of Seinfeld, the TV show Seinfeld, in yeah. that the characters are really shitty people, but you love all of them because yeah. they're really funny. Yes. You love them because they're funny and you love them because you you relate to them. You I, I think like I've written a decent amount of like man, I've written like eight or nine screenplays. Ten, I don't know. And the hardest part with it is like. A screenplay is making it very clear what the characters want, you know? And mm -hmm. sometimes you're like, they're going through the world and you're like, do they really? There's always something they want, but you're like, is it very clear? Can the audience feel with what they want? And here you just, you really feel what they want on, on a very like visceral level. You feel Reese Witherspoon wants this election more than anything, you know? Tammy wants to be loved more than anything you know what i mean matthew broderick wants to feel like he matters more than anything and you you just fucking feel it on such a such a level that makes you connect to the characters yeah and you're also aware that her winning the election is not gonna help it's Which not gonna make her feel any better and then the fucking dumb dumb football player guy he doesn't need anything he's he always gonna be happy. be happy he's always gonna be happy because he's you know he's dumb but he's also there's something like there's some grace there. You know what I mean? There's some wisdom in the dumbness, you know? Yeah. There's a sweetness to him. He, he has, 
he knows better what makes you happy his buddies and and sex no, no even th- even though even though he's like david is hilarious at like the way it opens is such a philosophical job like moment i wonder why god cursed me like this. <laughs> like it's just like if he also falls down that hill for so long <laughs> right i mean it's just beautiful um all right we, we should move to, we should yeah. move on to sideways because we're, yeah. we're almost an hour in here all right yeah, yeah and yeah, yeah. sideways okay. i think is even better yes yes like that's the thing that's one of the greatest two punches of all time Right up there was Fargo and Big Lebowski. Uh, were these movies back to back? Yeah. Oh wait, no, no, no. About Sh- was it? Oh yeah, you're right. I'm about sorry, Schmidt about came Sh- first. Yeah, which I have to rewatch because I remember liking it. But these two movies are just so fucking masterful that I'm like, all right, I got to give the whole category another. Well, to me, it's like Elections is amazing satire about characters who don't change, you know. And there's a broadness to it. And by the end, you're wa- you're literally watching n- literally none of the characters change, you know or go through any kind of, they're just stuck in their same patterns. And Sideways is now, you're getting a little deeper. You're getting into like a more nuanced characters, a little less broad, a little more specific. And it's, 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 um, it feels even realer and closer. And you're and honestly, just at the end of the day, like election is one of the greatest satires and Sideways is one of the greatest, most moving movies. It's just so moving. It's unbelievable. And yeah, it's less um, fun, I suppose. It's not as silly. It's not as uh, satirical, but it's just straightforward. But it's, it's hilarious. It's funnier to me. And to yes. me, ultimately, I like it, but not to skip to the end of the podcast, but I like it better because I just relate more. It's, there's less of the silliness or satirical stuff. And it's just like dead on. And like we were saying the other day, it's just you relate to so much, to so many aspects, to so many different characters in it. I typed in, I, I wrote, this is the saddest rom-com of all time. <laughs> that, that's to me what Sideways is. It's Because it has all the tropes of a rom-com. You know what I mean? He's, it's the classic thing where you're lying to the girl. Every rom-com has that moment or every comedy where you're like, at the end, Adam Sandler has to admit he's not really um, a real estate agent. And then she gets mad and then they get back together. You know, there's always that moment. So it has all the tropes, but like, to me, and as great as election is, to me, sideways is you're just watching like you're you're watching life. You're watching the most beautiful, real. It's just so fucking real, and like, and it's so pathetic. Like it, I love movies about pathetic people. I don't know why. Maybe there's something. <laughs> I, I got some ideas. <laughs> but like, this is a love letter to patheticness. It is the the it is a masterpiece about pathetic. When you watch them both walking down the side of the road after and they're talking to each other like they're in high school even though they're middle-aged men and thomas hated church like you fucking blew it when you watch these middle-aged guys try to be in swingers it's the most sad pathetic thing of all time well he's just first of all thomas hayden church's character in this movie they're both amazing they're both hilarious giamatti should have won the oscar i mean it's just one of the best performances ever (laughs) but thomas hayden church to me is like the second funniest movie character ever behind walt in uh big lebowski it's like john goodman and then thomas hayden church i mean one of my favorite jokes ever is he's been not to jump ahead but like his face has been bashed in because he's been caught cheating and the next moment we see him with a bandage on his face the waitress walks away and he goes i bet she's two tons of fun <laughs> like he's still thinking about it and obviously ultimately does i mean to me this is yes he is like it in a way it is very similar to big lebowski uh it's kind of a similar dynamic uh where you have this you know one guy who's like kind of this big dreamer who's completely delusional which is walter who kind of propels the plot and then you have the other guy who is actually more of a realist so you're watching a realist in it even though it's even though the dude is like the dude it is essentially a realist and a dreamer on a journey you know yeah and which is the old concept from don quixote which i wrote about because i was thinking about don i don't know if you know don quixote but like was don quixote is this guy who thinks he's a knight but he's not he's just crazy and he starts saying all these things in real life he convinces himself that the windmill is like a giant and he fights it and he has um, uh, um, he has like a second, uh, what do you call it? A knight's errand called Sancho Panza, who is a realist who's constantly telling him you're crazy. And that dynamic is like a big part of like, um, uh, you know, a lot of two person movies. And this is very similar where you have the realist and you have the dreamer and you're watching them the whole time. But everything Thomas Hayden Church says is hilarious. I mean, like to see a middle, 
middle-aged man say, we're trying to get your bone smooched. To see a middle-aged man say, bone smooched, <laughs> like, is one of the funniest, one of the funniest things ever. Like, it's just hilarious. Like, it's just so sad and so funny. <laughs> Well, there's just sideways. There's just too many things like you start writing down things you want to talk about. And it's just like this is going to be a four hour podcast because every here single fucking, shot. He literally says we're here to fucking party, man. <laughs> I mean, every shot is so great. And also that relationship that we've all had where he's just like, we're not even friends. Like, I'm just his roommate. You're just kind of stuck with this guy. You're completely different and you're stuck with them for life. And we all have relationships like that. In the movie, that line too, like, I just want to say, like, to me, it's like, yeah, to me, it's not always important for the characters to change, even though the characters in this movie or Paul Giamatti does change. But to me, what is great is when you learn about the character more as you go on. And there's so many lines in this movie that make you see everything differently. Just one little line that changes your whole perception. That line where you realize they're not even close friends, they're just fucking college roommates. The line where Thomas Hayden Church goes, isn't that why you had the affair? And you realize, oh, shit. Paul Giamatti, who's so full of self-pity, he's the one who fucked it up, you know? Right, right. Or, I mean, there's so, or the line where the, at the end where she reads the novel and she says, did he commit, did the father commit suicide at the end? And you realize his own father commits suicide. Like, there's so many little lines that make you go, oh, I'm learning, like, oh, Paul Giamatti de dealt with this, like, serious grief in his life, you know? And, and you just, your perception of the characters change, which is like, so much of what life is, you know? Yeah, I mean, you, we realize he's been dealing with his father's illness, which is just obviously, like, crippling. I mean, his... It's just, it's too hard to even talk about. I, I want to do, like, a full audio commentary of the movie and just be like, this is amazing, that is amazing. Um, I've lost so many thoughts because they keep coming through while we're... Well, we're, let's, talk, we're talking. let's talk about from the opening, because, like... The opening is amazing because yeah, you probably know this was me. You can tell so much about a person by how they run late to something like like because the opening scene is just like him immediately going, I'm going to be there. I'm out the door. And then you see him on the toilet. Yeah. Brushing his teeth. I mean, the first I mean, that's interesting too. that the very first thing he does is lies. I mean, the whole yes. movie is just all lies. Oh, this is what I want to bring up. You mentioned Don Quixote fights a windmill. It's funny because this whole movie is windmill themed. No, they yeah, stay I, at the windmill. Yeah, no, I think it's openly like I, I do think it's. I mean, Don Quixote is like considered the greatest like novel of all time, and like everything is kind of influenced by it on some level. But this is definitely a Don Quixote Sancho Panza story, where Sancho Panza is the realist, is the main character, you know, and essentially like because the whole time Thomas Hayden Church is like it's going to go great, everything's going to go great, your novel's going to get published, and he's just lying, and he is Don Quixote creating make believe. And Paul Giamatti is like constantly calling him out on that, you know, I love there's so many great details. Fuck. I mean, I know you want to go to the beginning, but there's also this whole sequence through the middle where he is when he's decided he's going to maybe date Sandra O oh and move and end the oh, marriage. My God. His outfit, he's wearing pajamas. It has like <laughs> it has the red ring here and the red sleeves. It literally <laughs> looks like like he's a big boy and then it, yes. it's literally like you're a child. But if you look at the outfit, he's literally dressed in kids pajamas like only yes. only a child wears clothes that have like the different color shirt collar or whatever well it's like they've both they so so they've both been beaten down by life on a different level right they've both kind of failed at their careers or has been but they've both gone the other way one person just goes fully into just delusion you know and then paul giamatti goes fully into despair which is his own delusion you know paul giamatti is so negative that also isn't an accurate depiction of life he's it's his own lie that everything is miserable, you know? So they've both gone, it's almost like he's gone fully into bitter adulthood and Thomas Hayden Church is just kind of like regressed into childhood, you know? And also Thomas Hayden Church's acting, his rhythm is like, it that that California bro-y kind of like rhythm that like high school almost, he almost sounds a little like um, Sean Penn in Fast Times. Like that, ca it's one of the best casting choices of all time, Thomas Hayden Church. Yeah, I mean, it's there's so many great moments. I mean, first of all, at the very beginning when they first meet up and he's so late. I mean, one of the great lines ever is the guy, the Armenian guy who's like, my opinion, fiction, waste of time. <laughs> I mean, he just he literally tells him 
it's a, your, your life is a waste of time. Your work is a waste of time. Also a great little metaphor there when he t- takes the I cake like the dark yeah. and he goes, I prefer the dark. I, I mean, pre- that yeah. is beautiful. Well, I prefer the dark. I mean, first, like, and I want it like the opening when he gets there, like, I want to show the difference between like in a lot of movies, you have cliche dialogue. This movie accurately depicts people saying cliche dialogue in real life. Like the way he comes in, that fake small talk is so perfectly captured. The way the mother brings him in and goes, look what the cat dragged. She doesn't know the phrase fully, you know, she, she took out the end. And the way they talk about the late in traffic, he's like, I thought you were, uh, I thought maybe you went to Tijuana and got lost. Like, it's just so perfectly captures that bullshit, like small talk. Amazing, right. Um, and then, uh, yeah, like the opening is incredible. And it, it's, uh, and I mean, there's so many great lines when, when he gets mad, like the opening lie where he hasn't fin- read the book a second time. And mm-hmm. then Paul Giamatti goes, page 750 on is exactly the same. Like, <laughs> right. <laughs> like when you realize how long the book is. <laughs> it's also hilarious and delusional that Giamatti thinks this guy is going to read his book. Of course, he's not going to read his book. He's a fucking meathead. I mean, there's even delusion there that he, like he's upset that this guy is not. It's kind of like the wife. He's upset with the wife and he has this self-pity, even though he fucked up. Like somehow he's mad at him for not yeah. reading this book. You're like, why would this guy ever read a 750-page book? He's a <laughs> fucking mongoloid. Um, and he's like, it is the perfect like like actor and writer. Like it's the perfect depiction of an actor, an actor who's just all full of shit and make-believe and a writer who's just like seeing all the horrible shit in life. And they're both like, I don't know, it's so much about failure that it's like, you know, obviously I, I relate to it. I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, for some reason, this movie about failed, pathetic people really gets to me. But like, there's, a, I've talked to a certain women who don't like this movie. And and they said the same thing. They're like, who cares about a bunch of middle-aged white guys, you know? And oh, I know. Most people are yeah. fucking idiots. It makes me so angry. Like, if you can't, because they just see a bunch of guys who are cheating and they don't get it because they want movies to, they think movies, people have to be morally upstanding when it's not really about that. It's about showing people how they are. But it's like when you don't have empathy for this movie, I'm like, well, you just don't have empathy for me because I am Paul Giamatti. <laughs> like, that is me. That is all. Like, I am fucking Paul Giamatti. Like, he is me in every way. Right. What, what do you think of this theory? Paul, I read a thing. Paul Giamatti looks at this movie like a Western. He thinks it's like a Western. He's like, to me, he's like, to him, I'm just quoting him. He's like, it's like these two guys, they come riding into town. They like hmm. belly up to the bar. And they got to get these women and they're trying to kind of conquer this thing. And then there is like a Western motif. Like there's a cowboy at the end of the bar. You can see there's like a painting of a cowboy. And it's like, it's very much a a buddy Western thing. And then like, even like they have to go back and get the wallet and then get back in time and all this stuff. It's like a little posse. I like that. I saw it more as just like middle-aged swingers, like the saddest (laughs) version of swingers where it's just like, people way too old to be doing this. How old are they, by the way? I'm like, are they my age? Should I kill myself right now? Like how they're, they're 40, at least. 40, I don't think right? you should kill yourself, but they're, I would say early 40. There's a very attractive woman walking underneath this. Uh, Dude, thing you here. should get your bone smooched. Um, I, I think they're probably in their forties. Yeah. Early forties. I mean, it's yeah. I saw it, but I, I like the Western idea. I saw it as middle-aged swingers. Yeah. Like there, it's like them trying to, it's the saddest, it's the saddest party of all time. <laughs> um, just again, like so many great jokes when Giamatti says, keep it elevated, talking about his <laughs> nose. It's fucking so funny. He's got a broken nose. He goes, all right, keep it elevated. Um, that's I mean, just yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think of like the other, like, uh, ama- I mean, there's so many, I mean, yeah, I mean, also one of the greatest, uh, I got to talk about this. So I make sure I don't forget one of the greatest, saddest, funniest, like tragedy comic parts of film history to me. Is when they're sitting on the water at the end, and Paul Giamatti says that one line mm-hmm. about "I am a thumbprint on a skyscraper. I am a uh, a smudge of excrement surging through a sea with all the rest of the sewage." And Thomas Hayden Church is like, "See, that's a great line. You you couldn't write a you know I couldn't write a line like that." And he goes, "I couldn't either." Yeah, I think it was Bukowski. Bukowski. That is one of the greatest, absurd, hilarious. The fact that he couldn't even write a line about how he means nothing is literally a line about how minuscule we are and even he could and to me it's like that's the saddest thing about being a failed artist the other artists 
don't have it great either. They're just articulating how meaningless life is. Mm-hmm. He can't even do that. Right. And it's just like, it's the ultimate absurd, like, <laughs> like, like beautiful, hilarious, dark fucking moment of all time. It's one of my favorite scenes in all, one of my favorite, like dark jokes of all time. Yeah. I feel the same way. I quote it all the time. I bring it up all the time. One of the great like, moments for sure. <laughs> was it um, me? It was Bukowski. I mean, talk about just this life. This movie captures the way life kicks you when you're down. The the only single moment in this movie I don't like, I think it's like almost, uh, I, I will say it's perfect because this is so small, but the one joke, which we talked about, the, the, the cameo from the principal, when they're walking in golf, it's like, hey, you mind keeping it down, pal? That joke is like a Caddyshack joke. It doesn't belong in there. And I wish I could be like, you got to cut that. It's so stupid. It's not a laugh. It's such a cheesy joke. And it's the only time the camera comes off of them and leaves it on this old guy and his son yeah, it doesn't even make sense yeah it's kind of a corny bit yeah i just kind of ignore i ignore the little flaws i don't even want to deal with them but yeah it's like a corny moment um i i agree with that uh i mean that that's the thing about this movie it's like and this is what i like to write it's like how do you this is one of the funniest movies of all time in my opinion but it's also but it's also one of the greatest like darkest deepest movies of all time and to me that if you can do both those things I'm like, that's the fucking, that's the mission. If you can be the funniest and truest and darkest movie of all time. But to do that, there's a, there's a challenge where you don't want to be too cartoony, you know? Yes. And sometimes, and I think this movie handles it perfectly because there are a couple of moments where you're like, it's a bit of a gag, but they get it right. You know, one of the moments, I think it works, but it's a bit of a gag is when he brings her the, uh, the novel. And then he goes back and just brings her the second part. Yeah. It's like a sight gag, but it's funny. It's, it's funny, but you're, at first, because the characters are so real, you're kind of like, what did he just have? Like printed, <laughs> like did he just have? You know what I mean? It's a bit of a side gag, but it works. But that's like the challenge is not to be too cartoony, and it kind of fails with the the, the guy, you know, the principal there. It's like they just they just want a little too cartoony, you know. And a little bit of a foreshadow in that scene where they pull out and he goes the opposite way. She goes one way and he goes the other. Which well, again, we see that exact image at the wedding. Oh, right. Yeah. Which um, is uh, the, maybe the greatest piece of acting ever when Victoria says I'm pregnant. I mean, Giamatti in that moment, pause this and go turn it on. And why? Like that is masterful and so touching. And it makes me literally cry out loud or whatever. I mean, it's so beautiful. That's something I could like. I've always loved this movie. And I haven't watched it for years. I've always said it's like one of my favorite movies. It's been so long since I watched it. And the thing I appreciated more this time i always thought paul giamatti was hilarious in it and so pathetic and like hilariously pretentious but his emotion the way he he can't hide his emotion in that scene and a couple other scenes that's the thing that like really brought the movie home to him it's it's not the kind like the comedy hits perfectly it's the vulnerability like he is the kind of person we know these people in real life where they just can't hide their emotions they're just too thin skinned, like he calls, like when he's talking about the wine, he's kind of describing himself. He can't hide his depression. You know, he doesn't have the mask other people have or the mask has been worn off. And there are scenes in this movie that he's so openly vulnerable, like that scene when she says that and the way it hits him. Like, it's just like you're just looking at his soul and you're just like, fucking, I'm looking right at it. <laughs> I'm looking right at it. Cause in that scene, you have him trying to almost be stoic, right? Mm-hmm. He's like, it's big of him. He's doing a good job. He's fucking, he's, he's okay with it. And then he has that moment where he's like, let's get a drink. He's literally finally okay with the situation. Right. And then life just throws another ton of bricks right over your fucking face. And he's like, oh, she's also pregnant. I can't do this. <laughs> right. And he reverts back to everything. He just runs. And it's also a significant moment because he's like, I don't owe this guy anything more. Uh, Thomas yes. Hayden Church. He's like, I, I, I came here. I showed up. This guy's a piece of shit. He's fucking up my life. I came. I did my service in the wedding. And he even seems to be enjoying it. Like, he seems like he does have some love for him. But this is just too much. He's like, he's supposed to make a speech. I mean, he's the best man. He's supposed to go yeah. make a speech. Runs and he's away. just like, I, fuck this. And he runs away. And of course, cracking open that bottle and, and drinking it with fast food in his mouth is just which so beautiful. Which is an interesting thing that you see in this movie a lot is that. Uh, so we always forget. So in this movie, he is an alcoholic, <laughs> but he's hidden it behind the wine tasting thing, you know? Mm-hmm. which is like a hilarious thing. Like the whole time it's just like, it's all about wine and all, but really he's kind of an alcoholic, 
But when he's doing okay in life, that's when he kind of commits to the illusion that he just loves wine. And when he's doing the worst, those are the moments where he gives up the pretense of the wine tasting. You see it first when he just grabs the bottle, runs down the hill, Mm -hmm. you know, and he just chugs the wine. He's like, I can no longer pretend I'm just a wine connoisseur. I have to, I have to like, I have to open up to the fact that I'm just a fucking drunk, you know? And then in that scene, which is really beautiful, he goes down to the vineyard and he takes the two after he chugs that wine, which is kind of like similar to. Sorry, I drank a lot of coffee before. Sorry if I'm talking too much or too quickly. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Uh, tell me after. But do you remember in um, uh, uh, Inside Lewin Davis when he yells at the folk singer on stage? Of course. And that's an amazing moment because Oscar Isaac's that character loves folk music. And in this moment, he's shitting on the thing he loves, you know? Yes. And it's a, point of like self-pity self-flagellation it's kind of similar in this when he chugs wine he's shitting on the thing he loves and he's also like kind of opening up to the fact that like this is all a pretense so he chugs the wine which is as a wine connoisseur you don't do right and then he holds those two grapes in his hand and they're like the two bundles like him and his wife like the two of them he's holding in their hands so on one level it's like this image of him thinking of the two things he no longer has but the other way I saw it, which I think is so moving, it's almost like he feels bad for the grapes that he did this to them, you know, oh, he, like, trade the grapes by chugging the wine like that, you know? Yeah, I, I, it's funny because I, I, I saw it just as like this, like calms him. This is how he calms down is to like see these things that he he loves. Like and that's been his one breakthrough life is the grapes. Well, I think that's similar, like to I guess to the second thing I'm saying, which is that like he he's reminded again of the love of the grapes and he loses that moment. But there are two of them. Like it is kind of like a pair. Right. Kind of like, you know what I mean? So but yeah, so you see that a couple times when he chugs the uh <laughs> the thing of this oh, wide spit. The, maybe the best joke in the movie when Hayden Church goes, is oh my, my mother just died. <laughs> so amazing. The fact that he has it locked and loaded and it's like the perfect thing to say. It's so funny fucking amazing yeah Yeah, he's ready he's ready to lie and we see that again later when he fake cries and giamatti realizes it he's like i'm nothing without her and he's doing this big fake and you see why he never made it as an actor because he's actually pretty shitty well yeah so that's the thing so do you put like to me i was wondering like when he has a big speech in the when he's crying you know about he's nothing without his wife yeah to you that's pure actor's monologue right Yes. Yeah. He's full of shit. I mean, obviously yeah. he doesn't give a fuck about his wife. He's just made, he's made it clear in his, in his actual real moment. <laughs> oh, by the way, another fun Easter egg. At one point they're watching a movie and the movie. Oh, is grapes of wrath. Grapes of wrath. Of wrath. I, I just mean, how good that. is that? Oh yeah. I didn't, I did cause I always wonder with pain. I always think there's a reason for everything. Every time they play something, I'm like, what's their meaning? And then they play that scene. I'm like, what is that about? And oh yeah. Fucking you're the Easter egg king. I'm the Easter egg king. And then there's also twice they're watching TV. One time it's Hitler and the other time it's George <laughs> W. Bush. So I don't know what yeah. that is. Um, and that just reminded me of Big Lebowski kind of when they cut to George W. You know? Yeah. But you see Hitler early and then you see Bush later, which maybe was just a subtle thing. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So that's an odd. He's basically just auditioning for him, you know. And also the other amazing thing was Thomas Hayden Church when he smiles at him at the wedding. is such an amazing, like when he's just like give that smile like we've. We fucking got away with it. You know, right, that, that right. I got away with murder smile. It's just like. It's just like Tom Taylor and Church, they're both just incredible fucking characters. They are like two of the greatest characters ever. And on a deeper level, metaphorically, they represent both sides of ourselves. You know what I mean? We have that depression, realistic side where everything's shitty. And then we have the delusional side where we just kind of like lie about life. And both those forces define all of us. And you're watching these two very concrete, fully realized characters, but they also, it's kind of like inside out. They also represent the two, the two sides of all of us. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you can relate to both of them. And I feel like I have relationships like this. I mean, obviously I relate oh, yeah. so much to the Giamatti character and it, it's just, it's almost like, it's almost like Virginia Madsen's speech about wine. Like it almost like hurts how much I love this movie. It it, it affects me so deeply. Like even trying to talk about it, I'm like, I can't even express it. It like fills me. My I can feel it in my body how fucking moving and touching this movie is. Well, I don't think I think some people underrate Alexander Payne. I think he's so unpretentious and he's so comedic. People are like, this is a really moving comedy. But this is just as deep symbolically as any like 
there will be blood uh godfather thing where it's like when they talk about wine they're talking about life you know and there's so many scenes where they drink it and paul giamatti goes this is shit this sucks and thomas hayden church is basically his catchphrase tastes pretty good to me yeah yeah <laughs> like, and also he's like are you chewing gum another amazing <laughs> joke but this the symbolism in this movie is what elevates it from just being like it's not just a great it is a great comedy and yet the symbolism elevates it to you're watching this this philosophical meditative movie about life and about how you view life and about kind of like the Hamlet line. Uh, there's nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it. So Paul Giamatti, so much of his despair is from his thoughts and how he views the situation. And I don't know. It's so, and the other, the other thing also, the, the, the reoccurring image in this movie, like the, is the knocking on the door. Right. So the movie opens with a knock on the door and ends right. with a knock on the door. And then you have so much of the movie, you see doors open and close. So in, it's like bookends symbolically in the, in the beginning, someone's knocking on the door. It's like life is just kind of pushing its way in. And at the end, he's the one finally going into someone's life. He's letting himself pursue, engage in someone else's life. You know, you know, he's finally opening up and knocking himself, you know? Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's just beautiful. I mean, there's just so many great things. I, just a couple other small comedy things that are great. They're sitting in the hot tub with no bubbles is amazing. <laughs> Another, I mean, pain really is the best at depicting depression and sadness, yes. like watching porn without masturbating. Uh, the barely legal. Uh, no, the, the new one. That's another the new great one. Joke. The new one. That's an amazing <laughs> joke. And he just matter of factly gets it. He's just reading it. Also, Thomas Hayden Church is reading the porn while watching MTV's The Grind. <laughs> just show, just what a perfect depiction of a piece of shit. But sitting in a hot tub where the bubbles aren't even working, the jets aren't even working is so great. And then another fun symbolism thing, uh, Sandra O, oh, whatever her name, I forget her name. She's wearing, uh, she has a peace sign. She's literally dressed like Dennis Hopper. She's on the motorcycle. <laughs> she has the brown jacket. She's like Easy Rider, but she's beating him with a helmet with a peace sign shirt, which is just beautiful. <laughs> um, also, how great is it too with her? Like you, even though she's not a main character, you see so much about, oh, she's not that great of a mother. <laughs> the kid staying with the uh the kid staying with her uh her mother when they're really loud and then wakes up the kid and then the kid goes back and immediately they, they apologize to Sandra O oh, and then immediately Sandra O oh talks louder. Yeah, oh she's a piece of shit. No, she's a great <laughs> piece of shit. This seems nice. Also, another amazing like symbolism or, or beautiful thing is that Thomas Hayden Church has just a clean conscience. He's sleeping. Oh, yeah. He literally falls asleep while Giamatti is going to get his wallet. He comes out and he's sleeping. <laughs> and then later on, he's he's like that same night after getting hit, they show him just sound asleep, which is great. That pain, those details of just showing this guy has no trouble falling asleep. All of these things he's doing, yes. he's not even considering it. He's, there's no, he's not self-conscious about this at all. He just has a sleepy conscience, as uh, Twain said. Yeah, no, he is. He, he, you know, the 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 bad sleep well, right? And it's like uh, there's that great moment where Paul Giamatti looks over and he's sleeping on the bed like a baby, you know. Yeah. And Paul Giamatti's like, "This is a child. <laughs> like yeah. this is a child I've been taking care of this whole time." And and the movie is like, in the, we got to talk about the score. The score is incredible. Like I didn't realize how great the score is, but it's to me the score is both like melancholy and hopeful, you know. Which to me is what the movie is. The movie, we talk about this with meditation. The movie's about acceptance. Like, he can't move on from his wife. He can't move on from that thing. And by the end, he accepts who he is. And he accepts where his life is at. And that's what allows him to finally, like, you know, pursue Virginia Madsen. So at the end, and when I say saddest rom-com ever, it's the boy getting the girl at the end. But it's also raining outside. <laughs> It's, also, it's like it ends on the sad rain, which to me is the 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 sad hopefulness of acceptance. You know what I mean? He is he's accepted life what it is, and he's driving to see her in the rain. And it's like it's the wisdom of realizing that your life kind of sucks and your dreams fail, but you can still connect with people and you right. can connect with people over our dreams failing. And that ending of the saddest rom-com ever him knocking on her door in the rain in the rain of life is just like to me that's that's the kind of movie i want to see i don't want to see a bullshit hopeful movie that's full of lies i want to see a movie that looks at life for what it is and still kind of sees the hope of 
of accepting life for what it is, the wisdom of it. And that's, that's what this movie is. Yeah, it is. Um, truly I'm talking a, too much. I really apologize. I've, no, that's all right. But no, it, it's, it's truly a masterpiece. I mean, I don't even know what else to add to it. I mean, Giamatti is so pitch perfect. I mean, the moment where they do meet up with Sandra Oh and her, her daughter and he's sitting there listening to whoever that character is. I don't know if it's the babysitter or what. And he's like, it was I think it's the mom. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's nice talking to you. And she's just going on and on about real estate, which is <laughs> real estate is always the perfect depiction of a depressing. She's like, I could have made a bundle if I had bought up yeah. a while ago. And he's just in this complete rage listening to her talk about fucking local real estate. It's, the detail. Um, it's so detailed. So many great details. So many jokes. It's just pitch perfect. The performances are amazing. And it makes me grateful that. They did it that they shot. I'm grateful for the boom operator, the lighting guy, the gaffer, everybody that is involved in this. I just want to blow them and thank them because <laughs> it's a movie. And you said you watched it. And yeah, I watch this movie like every three or four months. I just think it's I, just I can a complete see, masterpiece. And it is kind of like listening to a beautiful song. Like it is so, even though it's this hilarious comedy, it's also very meditative. You know, like it has a meditative quality to it that's like, that like a good even though i hate jazz like a good jazz score <laughs> and it's fun it is fun it's like so a buddy fun. adventure i mean when yes. they're in the car it, it's almost triggering to me it seems fun when they're in the convertible and she's in the back seat and they're driving sitting around smoking pot talking about wine getting laid uh, it just is seems like really a lot of fun to be on a trip like that it's my kind of fun i uh, swingers is a fine movie and the Apatow movie. movies where they're all smoking weed and having fun yeah they're good but i don't ultimately give a shit to me, I want to see this. This is like, it's fun, but it's also dark as hell. And you're also seeing people old. I, I like movies about older people when their dreams have failed. I don't, I'm not as crazy with the Judd Apatow. We're all smoking weed and roasting each other. And like, to me, that shit is shallow. This is the shit where it's like, you still have the fun al element and the adventure. You still have one of the greatest shots ever of the naked guy chasing him <laughs> up the door. And also, speaking of details, the line where she's like, he took Derek's wallet. Like, she calls him the same character. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, she knows him. She has, like, feelings for him. But, um, and it no, it's hilarious and beautiful. But also, I wouldn't lump Swingers in with Judd Apatow movie. I mean, Swingers, yeah, Swingers is, is very great. good. It's, it's very good. But this is, like, to me, this is as good as art gets. I uh, absolutely movie. agree. I think I, it's as good as a movie can be. I, I, uh. And the other thing, which we haven't really talked about, which is like, you know, as artists, because this is a movie about an artist, you know, and he wrote a book all about his grief and the world does not want to read it. You know, he gets rejected. And to me, that's the perfect metaphor for life. You want to matter, you know, you want to matter, but you don't. But then at the end, in one of the most beautiful voicemails ever, she read the book and she felt the pain of the book. So you kind of at some point have to give up. To me, this is the real message of life. You have to give up on the illusion that you matter in a big way and just connect to people individually. So he gives up on fame. He gives up on success. But she feels his pain. She connects to him. And he has her. And that's and life. That's, that's all you need. That's life. One person. That's, it's all you need is one person. And the dream of being successful, even if you get successful, it's still a dream. You don't matter. You are just a smudge of excrement in a, in a, in a, you know, surging out to sea. And you didn't even write that fucking line. That's how little you matter, but you well, can this connect. Is hurtful, <laughs> <laughs> but you can connect with someone also on the fact that you both don't matter and you can connect with someone else. And to me, that's, that's what, you know, that's what matters. I, I want to, every time I do comedy, I, I think I want fame and I, and, you know, obviously it's not going, you know, it's going okay, but you know, Time's running out, and uh, <laughs> but you know, at the end of the day, yes, I want my jokes to be heard by the public. But deep down, what I really want is that one girl in the audience to be like, "That joke really connected with me," and uh, starting a relationship. You know, that's deep down what we want. We think we want fame, but we really just want that human connection. And he accepts that at the end. Just a little of that human touch. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, we got to wrap it up. I'm, I'm getting uh, blown up here and I have a meeting that's changing and I have to respond that I can't go. So yeah, I'm making yeah, a film I'm... of my own. God damn it. Oh, right, right. Yeah. Not, but uh... not gonna be as good as this one. But 
Yeah. In closing, I think these are master and they're so good. That it makes me have to go rewatch uh, Nebraska, which I hated the first time I saw it and the descendants I hated and a bunch of it I liked, but I haven't watched it again. I, mean, so I, I, go think back in. I don't want to rope you into this like live or the audio, but you maybe we'll do a Patreon with the, the other ones. All right. Because uh, <laughs> well, Citizen Ruth, I got to finish it. Because Citizen Ruth, if you haven't seen Citizen Ruth, go watch it. I mean, it's incredible. And about Schmidt is incredible, too. Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, by the way, you know, Alexander Payne kind of got a little beat, too. Oh, I didn't know that. Yikes. It didn't stick. Oh, phew. Rose McGowan. <laughs> Rose McGowan literally mess- posted like she was like, Alexander fucked me when I was underage. Oh, Jesus. And then he goes, that's not true. She was overage. And uh, but anyway, I wish her the best of luck. And then I guess it just went away. Oh, that's good. Oh, shit. I, I got to I got to okay, wrap okay, this okay. up. Sorry, I got, sorry, uh, sorry. The movie producer here is calling me. OK, right. um, really, but really big timing me here. Um, I'm sideways <laughs> one uh, election two, but they're both amazing. I'm sideways one election two. And they're both in my top five favorite movies of all time. Yeah. Amazing. This is yeah. This is uh. This was fun, man. I uh. Yeah. So Sorry fun. if I talk too much. I drink a lot of coffee and I'm excited. I don't know. I I, I Louis you. So fun watching these movies. <laughs> Louis' assistant is calling me. I gotta run. This is great. We'll talk. Say hi soon. to Leah. Thanks everybody. Oh all yeah, right, you know you. Leah. Nice little flex Leah. there. Yeah. Um, all right. I gotta call, I gotta call it back. Cut. Cut. <laughs>